Uh, so variational Monte Carlo, this is the first quantum simulation method historically. It's the simplest, it's the simplest related to the Markov chains, Metropolis Monte Carlo. Um, and it started here at the University of Illinois. Uh, a graduate student named Bill McMillan, who happened to have John Bardeen as an advisor. Uh, but he wrote this paper. You see, John Bardeen didn't put his name on the paper. He's a graduate student, and this is his PhD thesis. He did it, and I, well, the paper was uh, sent in in November of 64, and so you can imagine what the computer was like in, say, 1963. <laughs> and look how many particles he did. He did 108 atoms in, in 1960. Um, this was on a computer. I don't even know what, it, maybe it was the ILIAC, but it was, you know, this was before integrated circuits. I don't know if it was tubes or not, but it was certainly where you had to, it was like almost before Fortran, if you can believe it, the assembly language programming. You, I, I think probably paper tape or punch cards programming, so forth, different era. Uh, but it was really a landmark calculation. He, he applied the ideas. I would, I'm not going to describe helium because I didn't, I was trying to fit in 40 minutes. But um, variational Monte Carlo is a zero temperature uh, uh, method. That is, you're trying to calculate properties of a single wave function. Um, and, uh, you know, we generalized this uh, a decade later to, to fermions. He did it for bosons. And he was trying to answer the question on, in liquid helium is how can you, you know, liquid helium is a superfluid and how can you describe the correlations at zero temperature is pretty much uh, related to Bose condensation of atomic atoms um, that uh, we're, you know, uh, how do you describe a Bose condensate of a system that's very strongly interacting. Um, so. Here's my notation in case I don't get to this. We have a potential energy, V of R, and R is referring to the three in coordinates of the electrons, R1 up to Rn. So that's our, gonna be our state space. And this is the Hamiltonian, as um, uh, Ron Cohen already uh, discussed with the electrons. You have a kinetic energy operator right here, which is del squared, non-relativistic. And then you have a potential energy operator, which is just going to be uh, what uh, Ron talked about uh, is the you know electron-electron interaction, electron-nuclear interaction. Of course, what Macmillan does was something else, a much harder potential like a Leonard Jones. Um, so variational Monte Carlo. Here it's all on one slide here. Actually, here is the box. Um, we sample these coordinates from psi squared using a Markov chain Monte Carlo, what I talked about the last few minutes ago. I haven't told you what this wave function is, but the idea of variational Monte Carlo is you make up through your imagination a wave function that is, in particular, we're going to talk about a slater jaster wave function, a particular form. This is what quantum chemists do all the time, except they have to do, this is the variational theorem here, the Raleigh-Ritz principle. You take any wave function that satisfies certain properties, this ratio here gives you an upper bound to the ground state energy. So then the idea is to parameterize this wave function and try to get better upper bounds. Now, quantum chemists stick to, uh, if you're talking about Hartree-Fock or self-consistent field, they stick to a single determinant as a wave function. So uh, that's like an independent particle uh, wave function. Now, I'll describe that in a minute. Then you can do these integrals without Monte Carlo, just directly. But that's missing an important part, which we call correlation, the fact that one electron, you know, the, the energy 
um, depends on where a second electron is. There's a relation between the probability. So it's not just independent particles moving, moving independently of each other, but there's a correlation between them. So once you put that factor into the wave function, you can no longer do these integrals very easily. I won't say it's impossible, but it's much more difficult. So what we do instead is we just sample this, this square of the wave function using the technology that I just talked about, the metropolis rejection technique. And then, so we have this ratio of integrals. How do we do it? Well, we divide by, we, we sample psi squared here, and then we divide this by psi squared on the top and the bottom. And we end up with something that we call the local energy. I should have written this out in more detail, but it's just, an, just multiplying and dividing by something. This, this equation becomes this equation in Monte Carlo. We just take this uh, numerator and divide by psi squared. And so one of the psi's cancels out, and you get h psi over psi, which is here. And I put real here in case you happen to have a complex wave function. That's the symbol where you take the real part, right? OK, so this is the local energy. And so the statement is that the upper bound to the ground state energy is the average value of the local energy averaged over the distribution of psi squared. Okay, so that's the first step. So again, that's just one or two steps of algebra. Um, now, so then a, a meta step would be, okay, so there you have to do a Metropolis Monte Carlo sample psi squared, and um, then calculate the average value of here, and calculate the error bars. And of course, in Monte Carlo, you could, in principle, get a fluctuation which would violate this upper bound. That's perfectly possible. So you get the variational energy, um, the plus or minus some error bar. And within that error bar, you'll get an upper bound. And then you want to minimize, you want to take, you optimize this wave function to get the best upper bound. And that's called the optimization. And uh, Jeremy McManus is going to talk about this on Thursday, about the optimization. I'm not going to do that today. Now, the advantage of the Monte Carlo is you can use any computable function here, psi. So you're not limited to this very simple independent particle picture, but if you think a certain type of correlation should be in the wave function, you just throw it in. The only thing is you have to be able to calculate it you have to be able to optimize the parameters in there. But you can put any kind of like correlation. Uh, we, we, we'll talk more about that on Wednesday, about what you could do. We're just going to take a single example today. Now, there's a very important principle which makes this better than you might think. And it's called the zero variance principle. Uh, this means, in Monte Carlo, zero variance means that there is a procedure to increase the efficiency um, without limit. Zero, I mean, we talked about the efficiency is how quickly the error bars go down. So zero variance means that if you get better and better trial wave functions, your efficiency will get higher and higher and higher without limit. Right? And, and so basically, you can see that right from here. Remember, the error bars are going to be the fluctuations in the local energy, right? Remember, the statistical fluctuations are, are caused by the fluctuations in your estimator. But if psi is an exact wave function, h psi over psi is a constant. There will be no fluctuations. So not only will you get the exact energy, but you'll get the exact energy without any fluctuations. So you can just do a one step of your Monte Carlo, and you'll get the exact answer. So, so, and I'll show you how this pans out in a few minutes. That's the zero variance principle. And the result is, it, you know, is that we can do Monte Carlo. Usually, you think Monte Carlo, you're going to be limited to like 1% accuracy. But as I guess we, we might describe later on, we can get four or five significant decimal places sometimes out of Monte Carlo without doing billions of steps. 
because of this. Now, how do you treat spin in Quantum Monte Carlo? This is kind of an ex aside here. Actually, maybe I should skip over. You know, uh, first, let me talk about uh, a trial function for the bosonic part. By bosons, you know, electrons are fermions. They have to be anti-symmetric. Bosons, like the Higgs boson, is a symmetric wave function. Uh, and the Monte Carlo really likes bosons because the wave function can be made uh, positive and there's no sign problem. Uh, but we're going to get to that later on, uh, not today. But uh, it, so this is the wave function that Macmillan used uh, for helium. It's called the Jastro or pair product wave function. So just imagine, again, you have uh, these marbles in a box and you have some sort of repulsive potential. What kind of a wave function would you want? Well, you just want to use a wave function so that those particles don't get close together. And this is the form that you want. It's just like the classical distribution of uh, uh, particles interacting with the potential U. Okay, but U here is now the wave function and not the potential. So this is actually a general rule for making wave functions. You make a wave function that looks like the potential. Um, and so if, if this becomes a, if, you, if the potential becomes like 1 over r, r, like it is for electrons, you, you say you want the wave function to be, um, uh, uh, have this product form, or it's a sum in the exponential. <clears throat> I'm sorry, it shouldn't actually vanish, but I should say get small. Uh, and this, sometimes we call this a pseudo-potential. I should have taken that word out because that's kind of confusing. But anyway, Remember what we have to calculate in variational Monte Carlo is the so-called local energy. That is um, this quantity right here. This is the H psi over psi. Well, here I've taken, sorry, this wave function, and I've calculated the local energy, and it has this form. And remember, V is the potential, and U is the wave function, as they call the Jastro correlation factor. And that's what you're try to optimize uh, today in the lab is for the electrons. Anyway, this is the form for local energy if you don't have to worry about anti-symmetry. And the reason I introduced it is because of the, I want to find out what forms we could use for U. And you could imagine, remember that the local energy should be a constant if this is a good wave function. And so you can imagine bringing two electrons close together and what happens to the various terms here. Well, the potential energy would diverge as 1 over r. And let's assume that this u factor is finite at the origin, and we can make a Taylor expansion in powers of r. So u of r is a pair term in the wave function, and we you know, expand in powers of r. And we can write down, we can try to make this local energy um, uh, uh, not diverge because the one over r term, the potential energy is going to diverge and we're going to have this term which is the Laplacian of u and we have a term which is the, which is the uh, a gradient of u squared. And so those are these, these two terms here. And you see that there is a term that goes like one over r and that's given by the derivative of u at the origin. And so that leads to what's called the Cato cusp condition. That is the, the wave function for a 1 over r interaction um, uh, has to go to a finite value at, u equal, at r equals 0 when two particles get close together. And, and its derivative has to be this minus 1 half if you don't worry about spin. And, and so, you know, this is, uh, it tells you something about uh, the exact properties of the wave function in order that the local energy would be, uh, uh, would, would not diverge. Now, what did I skip over here? Okay, uh, I want to talk now about fermion statistics, and I, I assume that you know what a Slater determinant is. So if you don't have interactions, this is the solution to Schrodinger equation for anti-symmetric particles, fermions. Uh, that the wave function is this Slater determinant, that a determinant, so if you have n electrons, um, 
It's an n by n matrix, the Slater matrix. And so uh, the coefficients, you, you have, and this, this is in periodic matter conditions. The, ec the exercise you're going to do this afternoon is, um, is going to be a homogeneous electron gas. And so, you know, just have, does everybody know what periodic boundary conditions are? So uh, maybe I should say a, a word about this. Um, what we're trying to model in condensed matter physics is a system that has 10 to the 23rd or 10 to the 30th particles, right? So, but on a computer, typically we can do a few thousand electrons, not 10 to the 23rd, right? So we want to make our little piece of the simulation look like an infinite system. So if you put any kind of surfaces in, if you put just a thousand electrons in a box with hard walls, the walls would completely dominate the solution. Uh, you would just, be, I mean, because surface effects would be so large. So what you do is you Mathematically, you put it on a torus, you know, a donut that does not have any surfaces, right? It's a homogeneous system. And, and so that's called periodic boundary conditions. I mean, an actual donut has curvature, but periodic boundary conditions doesn't have a tur curvature. So in other words, in one dimension, you would say you put it on a circle, and, or in other words, you put it on a line and if a particle, an electron goes out this side of the line, it comes back in the other side, right? That's periodic boundary conditions. And the reason why you do it is to get rid of finite size effects, to get as close as you can to the thermodynamic limit. I'm going to talk about more, more about that on Wednesday. Uh, and under periodic boundary conditions, if you want to, what are the states of an electron? The states are just plane waves right here e to the i k dot r. And the Pauli exclusion principle means if you have n electrons, you fill up uh, the lowest plane wave states once and only once. That's a, a Fermi liquid. Uh, and, you know, you have occupation of the lowest energy states. And this is a spin function. So because electrons have up and down spin, uh, you know, you, you uh, we want to, typically, I skipped over that slide, but uh, we, we essentially, if we have uh, 100 electrons, we assign 50 to be spin up and 50 to be spin down. Okay, and so in fact, uh, you fill up these plane wave states, you would find the, uh, you would doubly occupy each of those 50 lowest states because you have the spin coordinate. So, each plane wave state would have a spin up and a spin down particle in it. So that's what this kind of represents right here. And so, uh, but you me need to have an anti-symmetric function, and this is anti-symmetric, and that, that is if you exchange two of the coordinates, uh, R1 with R2, uh, that would cause two of the columns in this later matrix to be in exchange, and that would give you a minus sign. Now, uh, this is the condition on the plane waves, this K here, and I'm going to talk later about these so-called twisted boundary conditions. So for the moment, you can just set this theta equal to zero, and you can say that if L is the size of the box, then the um, uh, K is 2 pi N over L, where N is some integer, and this describes which state you're filling, this N. Okay, and so because you have periodic boundary conditions, the momentum which is of the state, which is this K, is discrete. That is, there's certain values of allowed momentum. Now, so this would be the exact solution for non-interacting electrons, this Slater determinant. That's the ground state. Uh, we turn on an electron-electron interaction, the one over R interaction, and um, we want to somehow correlate the electrons, and we do it by multiplying by this Jastrow factor that I just described, this U function, okay? And uh, I just described, uh, you know, what the cusp condition is, so that we know that U, this U function 
at least at, as r goes to zero, it has to obey the cusp condition. Okay, but this is where we put correlation in, and this is where Monte Carlo takes over because with this kind of wave function, you can no longer calculate properties except by doing Monte Carlo because this is just like the classical problem as Macmillan discovered that uh, it's like calculating properties in a liquid, a classical liquid. You can't calculate partition functions of a classical liquid analytically unless you make a lot of approximations. And it's the same in variational Monte Carlo. Once you put on this factor, you, you need to do Monte Carlo to calculate it. Okay. Now, I'm going to skip over this because I'm running out of time, but uh, we'll get to this later on. There's particular f ways of dealing with this determinant here in Monte Carlo. Bef if you just had this factor, it, as Macmillan discovered in 64, it's very much like doing a classical liquid. Okay, but once you have this determinant, things are a little different, but not that much different. Conceptually, it's no different. There's just fast ways uh, to calculate the determinant, and on um, Friday, I guess, what? I don't think I'm talking about that. Uh, he's not going to talk about that, but he oh, could talk he about it. <laughs> okay. Um, but, you know, well, that's one of the issues that we're confronting is how to, if you're going to do this for millions of electrons, how you would calculate these determinants quicker. So here's a variational Monte Carlo code. Um, uh, it, it looks very much like the Metropolis code because I just copied it. I just changed some of the symbols, right? You initialize the state, you put your n electrons in the box, and uh, except now we have the wave function and not the energy, right? So we calculate the energy and everything else is the same, so I won't go through it. So actually you calculate the square of the wave function for the new point and the old point. Uh, okay, so uh, let's see how much. Uh, what do you get out of a simulation? Well, of course, the variational energy is the number one thing we get out. But I know that in the lab we want to talk about other things. You can calculate other properties. The energy has the advantage that you have an upper bound and it's second order in the errors of the wave function. These other properties uh, are only first order in accuracy and do not have an upper bound property. But you still are interested in like how the particles are arranged, like what is the momentum distribution and so forth. I guess I give an example of the momentum distribution and the pair correlation function. Uh, the pair correlation function, this tells you, uh, uh, you know, this is an example of a liquid. These are the uh, up and down spins or something. This is kind of a strange electron liquid where it's ferromagnetic, I guess, where they're separated. And you kind of wonder, uh, you know, how the electrons are distributed. And so you might compute this in the afternoon for the electron gas. These, these are for helium because that's what happened to be in my slides. But here, this is the pair correlation function is the function of distance. Um, and so this is very characteristic. So this, if, if you're sitting on a helium atom here, this is uh, what is the distribution of other helium atoms with respect to that atom at the origin that's put at the origin. And we have actually four different curves here, but they all look basically the same. Um, uh, the, basically, the, the thing is, the, the pair correlation function is normalized so that infinity, it goes to one. That's just the normalization uh, that's applied to it. Or if, if they were randomly orient, uh, placed in there, the probability would be one. Um, and so this big peak here says there's a, a large core, this, this, this uh, zero here and this big peak say there's a lot of correlation in the liquid. Namely, that if there's an atom at the origin, there's not another atom within two angstroms of that atom. There's an excluded region. That's what this zero here is saying. That's a very good thing for you to know in your code. If you start out with an initial condition 
where there's an atom sitting in here, it doesn't like it, right? It, wants, it doesn't want other atoms to be there. And then where do the atoms go? Well, they get pushed out into a shell. This big peak means that around the atom, there's a shell probably of around 12 other atoms that are sitting in a, in a cage. And that's what this peak is. And then there's a minimum here. Well, that's just a ripple effect. There's a shell here, and then those atoms are excluding other atoms from getting close to them. So that makes a minimum. And then there's a, a, a subsidiary peak. They make a shell around themselves. But you see they gradually dies off as you go to infinity. So this is the structure of a highly correlated liquid. The ones in electron gas that we'll just study later are not so correlated. But this gives you an idea of, of the kind of things that you could look at in correlation functions. Because if you just dump out the coordinates of your random walk on the screen, you don't see anything. It's just too much noise. You have to average your quantities in order to get something useful coming out. And the pair correlation function is one of the key quantities you can look at. Now, here's the momentum distribution. This is really old data, uh, but this is, if you can, you can measure with, uh, in a synchrotron, the electron distribution, the momentum distribution, an x-ray comes in and bounces off an electron, and whether it picks up energy or not, you can see what's the momentum of the electron. And this, this is our theoretical calculation, and this shows you uh, uh, if it was an ideal um, uh, system that has no electron-electron interactions, it would just be a step function, the famous Fermi function, that it would be one and then, uh, then it dropped down to zero. But because of the correlation, uh, it drops, it's less than one for finite k. This is the momentum. And so this is still the sharp edge at the Fermi surface, this jump here. I should have put down a better graph than that. But uh, I, uh, I can show you, maybe next time, I can show you uh, like better momentum distributions. But this is the way you calculate it in quantum Monte Carlo. You take, you, you do a variation of Monte Carlo sampling, and then you throw an electron an arbitrary distance away, and you see how the wave function changes. That's what this is. This is, um, uh, you calculate, uh, uh, you sample size squared and you calculate this, this funny distribution. And it's funny because of the uncertainty principle in quantum mechanics. We do our random walk in our space, but momentum is conjugate to position. And so to calculate the position, the momentum, we have to, do, we have to throw a particle a random distance away. And here's the kind of the justification, which you can look at the notes. By the way, these slides are online uh, uh, at the uh, class web, uh, uh, website, and so you can, you can study this integral uh, on your own time. But basically, this is the probability distribution of, of, for the momentum distribution, um, and then this is how it's related to this so-called single particle density matrix, how it's calculated. So that's an, uh, an, an example for electron gas of some non-classical distribution, uh, you know, the momentum distribution that shows that Fermi liquid effect. Okay, so Ron uh, Cohen already introduced the electron gas, that is the, the very simplest uh, electronic Hamiltonian uh, for an, uh, in, in the thermodynamic limit, which just has a one over R interaction and the, the potential of the electron, of the ions is smeared out, and this is the phase diagram of the electron gas is a function of temperature and density that we've actually calculated with quantum Monte Carlo. And you see the electrons and metals are way up here at high density, and there's something called a Wigner crystal at low density and low temperatures. There's temperature on this axis. Um, and uh, here is the, remember the U of R function is the Jastrow correlation factor. It turns out that it has a simple, a, a optimal correlation factor has a very simple uh, formula in k-space, this so-called Gaskell or RPA form. 
And I don't know, Jeremy, are, are you going to use this in the lab or are you just going to optimize the form? Well, an interesting exercise would be to optimize this form and uh, optimize it and compare it to this form. But this gives you the behavior of the optimal Jastrow factor, that is, the one that gives you the lowest energy for the electron gas. Um, and I already discussed the cusp condition uh, right here for U function, but there's another limit where we can de derive exact properties, and that is if two electrons get very far apart, how are they correlated? Well, it turns out that it, they should, the, this gesture factor should go like 1 over R in three dimensions. And this gives rise to some of the important properties, like the dielectric properties and so forth. It also means that we have to use evolved sums in our code because the potential is long range and also the wave function is long range. Um, the, uh, so anyway, that's just a, a, a brief aside. And we'll, I'll talk about uh, evolved sums on Wednesday also. Uh, but at the moment, the, the problem is, you, you remember we're using periodic boundary conditions. Um, and what, what about as an electron, uh, take two electrons and pull them apart, eventually one is going to cross out of the box and come back in the other side. What do we do with the potential when it does that? We just cannot assume that the potential is zero at the edge of the box because one over R doesn't decay quickly enough. And what's done is to add, a, a, sum all the images out to infinity analytically, and that's what evolved sums are. And we want to do the same for the wave function as also. Uh, and you know, I'll, this is the whole subject is called finite size effects, and then I'll talk about that on Wednesday, about how you do this and why it's important. Okay, so final. This is my last slide. Um, um, there was a question about this, now I forget what it was, but anyway, this is the log-log graph, and this shows you the error bar, both the statistical error and the systematic error as a function of computer time. And if you take a simple wave function, like Hartree-Fock or Slater determinant, you end up on a graph like this, that is, the error bar comes down, uh, and then flattens out because essentially the, uh, a, a simple Slater determinant doesn't have a lot of correlation in it. What you want to do is put in that Jastrow factor and then you will improve things in two ways. First of all, you'll get a lower upper bound. You'll go from here, this curve down to this curve. But you also, because of the zero variance principle, have a faster convergence. It doesn't mean that the slope of this is different. That's always minus uh, the error goes as uh, uh, 1 over the square root of computer time. The slope is always the same, but the coefficient is different, and that's the efficiency. So you're on a different curve, and, but there's a certain point at which you just have to, there's no, the, there's no reason to go any further because you just have systematic errors there. So th this is the point at which your error bars from the Monte Carlo are less than the systematic errors when you go out down here. But you can then come out with a better trial function that would be, you know, even further down here in lower error bars. Or you could go to a better algorithm like diffusion Monte Carlo or path integral Monte Carlo that goes further down here. You get smaller systematic errors. And that's what we'll talk about on Wednesday, the diffusion Monte Carlo. So that's the end. So questions? Yeah. So you mentioned how you know the Jastrow function is important so that it cancel out the singularity and the Coulomb potential. So does that mean that if I have a wave function that doesn't have a Jastrow correlation, I would not be able to use BMC? So for example, if no, I no. You can use any any time you can compute. The, he asked me if you had a wave function that didn't was not Jastrow, could you use VMC? Yes. You see that the development of of the, of the variation of Monte Carlo, as long as you can compute the wave function, you can sample it. Um, but coming back, we have to ask about the variance of the local energy. Remember, that's going to control the error bars. And so 
in order to get small error bars, you want the variance of the local energy, how much the local energy fluctuates to be finite and small, hopefully. So that's the question. So you were about to tell me what kind of a wave function that you were going to use. So for example, if I'm using a hot repulse wave function, I'm just interested in calculating the expectation value using V and C. Right. What I'm sort of worried about is uh, when two electrons will get very close to each other, the divergence of the Coulomb will not get canceled. That's right. He is asking me about what happens if you run a hart fock You can do it. The question is, uh, yeah, I can use this board here. We haven't used it yet. So the question is, does this integral, the variance, goes like the integral dr of, of psi squared times the local energy squared. Is this uh, finite? That's the question. If you work it out for a hart fock it is finite. That doesn't mean it's small. So you find that the error bars, if you run with a hart fock and that's actually a standard test case that we use in variational Monte Carlo to see if your code is correct, because we see if we can get the same result that's coming out of a quantum chemistry code. You do. You do get the same answer. It's just you don't get very small error bars because of this. This, this, this is finite. Now, you, you may wonder why is it finite? Is that really the question? Because this local energy is diverging like 1 over r squared. But you have to save you this a factor in three dimensions, r squared dr, and it cancels. And so that's why it makes the integral finite. But you get big fluctuations whenever any two electrons get close together. Yes? From your last slide. Yeah? If you have different uh, tetraic air functions, you have different solutions, probably. Yeah, but my guess is if you, if you, that means if you have a look, so now no, we're what we're doing is very he asking me, I in my last graph I gave an illustration of two different um, two different wave functions and you know one I said was better than the other. Uh, these are I gave an example of one that had a, a Slater determinant and one was a Slater Jastro. And the um, uh, I, could, I could make a plot, I'll have to put this in my graph, of, of energy and variance. And Hartree-Fock would be up here. It has, the exact answer would be here. Zero variance and some energy. This is what we want. We want to calculate the exact answer with zero variance down here. If you do Hartree-Fock, you would get a point up here. If you do slater jastro you would get a point like this. This is in variational Monte Carlo. You, you do what we call backflow, you may get a point like this. You come down in energy and in variance, down like this. And generally speaking, it's in, in a sort of a linear fashion. This is not a, well, this is a, a Hartree-Fock would be a saddle point, namely, it would be a, it would be the best wave function in this class, but the class of wave functions does not include the exact solution. And again, Slater-Jastrow, there exists a Slater-Jastrow wave function, which is the absolute best Slater-Jastrow wave function, but it's not the exact solution because that had not only two body correlations, but three body and four body correlations. Does that answer your question? Okay, any more questions? Before, you guys must be tired and hungry. Okay, any other questions? We're going to revisit all this on, in the lab and on Wednesday, too. Produced by OCE Atlas Digital Media at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign.